are in a series. Does anybody know the series name? Growing in Godliness is our series that we are in. Um, and so I am blessed to be able to just share a word with you this morning as a continuation of our series. Um, it's been amazing so far. Don't y'all agree? Yes, yes. It has been an amazing, um, incredible series that that. Each and every week, we have gotten the opportunity to just take something with us, take something special about each of the virtues that we've gone through um, so far. And so just to remind you all, anything that is healthy grows. So in this series, we have been giving the nutrients that are prescribed by the scripture in order to constitute growth in the things of God. The goal for the end of this series is for us to understand the virtues of godliness that will create the desire and mandated growth in our walk with the Father. I feel like we have been growing and growing in godliness week after week after week in this series. And so I'm going to pray and we're going to dive on in, okay? Amen. Lord, I thank you. I bless you. I just pray right now that as we continue in this series of growing in godliness, that you speak to each and every one of us in a unique way that we can receive exactly what you have for us. Um, for each message, Father. So I pray that as we go forth today, Lord God, that you allow me to be your vessel, Lord God, to speak the word that you have given me and that it is useful as people leave this place that, that are in, they are inspired and informed by your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so this morning I um, get an opportunity to speak about brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness. And I, I, I always find it um, interesting when uh, I get the honor, I'll say it like that, the honor to speak on particular topics that uh, I feel like maybe I, I, I'm not the best person to talk about it. Because those of you who know me, know me, know that I, I'm not necessarily the warmest personality that you might encounter. I'm a very um, intellectual driven, logic driven person. And so I approach things from a logical place. Now, if, you're, if you approach things from an emotional place, we gonna clash. <laughs> And so sometimes I feel like I, um, the words that I say might not necessarily be the kindest, but the Lord has taught me some things throughout the preparation of this message. Um, and so we're going to start off with our foundational scripture of this series. Second Peter, um, one, we're going to go five through seven. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your persever perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And so that's where we're parking today, in, in brotherly kindness, and one thing about this brotherly kindness virtue that we're talking about is we've gone through all of the other ones and they've been amazing. But this is the first one that we're really digging into that extends beyond yourself. Everything else has been inward focused. You know, moral excellence. What, how can, what can I do to become a, a, a morally excellent person? Um, knowledge. You know, I have to, what, what kind of things do I need to do to grow in my knowledge? Um, self-control. That's self-explanatory. You know, self-learning to, to control yourself. Um, in your self-control, perseverance, having the ability to, uh, to, to stand strong and stand firm and keep going through and not just stopping. Um, in your perseverance, godliness, your own personal relationship with the Lord and learning what it means to be a godly person. All of those things are inward focused. But then we jump to brotherly kindness. And all of a sudden, other people are involved. 
But the amazing thing about it is all of the others were necessary in order to be able to be successful at brotherly kindness. You had to focus on yourself. You had to get things right within yourself first before you can extend to anybody else. Amen. Amen. And I love how the scripture specifically refers to brotherly kindness, not just kindness, but brotherly kindness. See, brotherly kindness is uh, because we have a, hopefully, we have a vested interest in our family. You know, there's kindness and then there's the kindness of family. You know, we, 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 we are concerned about their success. And so we want to be kind. We want to make sure that we can do whatever we can to help them succeed. You know, the world is always going to come against us. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter where you walk, no matter what you say, the world is going to come against you because the enemy has a mandate. He has mandated himself to steal, kill, and destroy, right? And so he's always coming against you and using things of the world to steal, kill, and destroy. So we need to be kind to be able to be strong as a family, We need to be able to lift each other up, whether it's your biological family, whether it's your spiritual family, whether it's your church family right here at Anchor Chapel. We want to make sure that we are kind to our brothers and sisters. I love to tell uh, my kids, I've always raised them, be kind to your siblings. Like, don't don't fight. Don't 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 go head to head. Just be kind. Does does anybody else raise their kids to, to do the same thing? Be kind. Don't fight your siblings. Y'all are on the same team, right? You know, now if somebody else comes comes against y'all, guess what? Y'all getting together and taking them down. But don't, don't, don't fight your siblings. Be kind to your siblings. And that is because I want to remind them that there is a vested interest in family. There is a vested interest uh, between brothers and sisters. And so as... As I've been praying and seeking the Lord and preparing this message, there are two things that I learned about kindness that I want to share with you all today. The very first thing is that kindness is supernatural. Can I get an amen? Because kindness can be hard. (laughs) It's more than just being nice. Kindness is like next level nice. It can be hard. And sometimes it feels like kindness gets you nowhere. Y'all ever heard that term? Nice guys finish last. You know, you being nice and nobody cares. They're walking all over you, you know. But kindness can be hard because I'm sure that everybody in this room has at least one story where you had every right to say all the words. I'm going to leave it at that. You had every right. You had been pushed to the brink. And all of the words were right on the tip of your tongue. But in that instance, you chose to bite your tongue and be kind. But it wasn't easy. That's not an easy thing. Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10, it says, Let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap if we do not give in. So then while we as individual believers have the opportunity, let us do good to all people. How many people? Not only the people that you like. Only the people that agree with you. Only the people that believe like you, all people, let us do good to all people, not only being helpful, but also doing that which promotes their spiritual well-being and especially be a blessing to those of the household of faith, born again believers. And I love, I I specifically um, selected the amplified version because it it gives a little, it gives a little oomph to this scripture just to, to, to specify a couple of things. We as individual believers, we have an opportunity 
to do good to all people. And it, it talks about us promoting all people's spiritual well-being. But then it tells us, but especially be a blessing to those of the household of faith. Be, uh, be especially be kind to our brothers and sisters in the faith. Amen? And I just, I thought this was interesting because if kindness was easy, we wouldn't need this scripture to encourage us, right? <laughs> That's, that's how the Lord works. He's like, you don't know that you're going to need encouragement, but I'm going to give you something to be there for you because you will need encouragement. You will come up on, an, on a situation where you want to say all the things. But don't get weary. Don't become discouraged because I got you. Amen? And the thing about kindness, I say kindness is supernatural because Kindness is essential to the nature of God. He is a kind God. Thank the Lord. <laughs> because he, I, I know for me, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but I'm going to say for me, there are many times, many times, many, many, many times where the Lord could have done something bad for my actions but he was kind to me because he, it's essential to his nature. And when we submit our lives to God, kindness becomes part of our conduct because our character is rooted in him. So all of us who profess to be born again, all of us who profess to be believers, do your actions really show that? Do your actions show the character of kindness that is essential to God's nature. And I want you to think about that because we say that we have submitted our lives to God, but when we submit our lives to God, we, our lives should mirror who he is in every aspect. And that includes being kind to our brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. So kindness is supernatural. God has given us encouragement and he, and he has, uh, um, given us the strength to be able to, to walk in his image through kindness. But once we, once we grasp hold of the supernatural nature of kindness, once we get it, once we begin to walk in it in every situation and not just when we feel like it, kindness can be transformative. It can be transformative. And that's my, my next thing that I learned. Kindness in, is transformative. And um, I, it really got me thinking about a particular story in the Bible. Um, King Saul. Um, anybody familiar with King Saul? King Saul, the people's choice, right? <laughs> king Saul. He was the king. He was the people's choice, but he wasn't a great king. He didn't follow the instructions of God. And so what did God do? God came and chose a king. He chose David as the king. But David was, he still had some growing to do, so he couldn't become the king right away. And the interesting thing about this situation, I'll call it a situation, <laughs> Saul knew that David was chosen by God, but David was raised up in the house, in Saul's house. Basically, yes, I'm coming to take your job. Basically, but David and Saul, I mean, um, David and Saul's son, Jonathan, they became the best of friends. Like think of your best, best, best friend. David and Jonathan were closer than that. They were like brothers. They formed a covenant relationship and they grew up together. They learned all of the things of, uh, of life together. And one thing about Saul Saul, he saw all of this, and he knew everything that was going on. But because God had refused King Saul and chose this boy, David, to be the next king, Saul was very, very jealous, as you can imagine, right? He was very jealous of David. And because of this jealousy, Saul got to the point to where he hatched a plan. His plan, well... Well, if I kill David, then David can't be king, right? And so for years and years and years, 
Saul set so many traps to kill David, but God protected David through it all. Amen? Amen. And so eventually they came to a point to where Saul and his son Jonathan were killed and David was crowned king of Israel. And so I wanted to make sure to give y'all that little, uh, that little precursor because David became the king of Israel and it was custom during those days to where when the new king ascended to the throne, he exterminated the family of the old king. He exterminated everyone in the family, everyone that was loyal to the old king because he didn't want any of the descendants of the old king to try to come and take the throne back, right? As long as a spark of life from that old king's family still smoldered, it was a threat to the new king. So knowing this and taking this, we're going to uh, read from Second, cha- Second Samuel chapter 9. We're going to do 1 through 13, all 13 verses, because I think the, the entirety of the story is important. So let's hold on for this scripture. Amen. One day, David asked, is there anyone left of Saul's family? If so, I'd like to show him some kindness in honor of Jonathan. It happened that a servant from Saul's household named Ziba was there. They called him into David's presence. The king asked him, are you Ziba? Yes, sir, he replied. The king asked, is there anyone left from the family of Saul whom I can show some godly kindness? Ziba told the king, yes, there's Jonathan's son, lame in both feet. Now, I'm going to stop right there because Jonathan's son was lame in both feet. They, they, they say that a couple of times. The reason that Jonathan's son was lame in both feet is because at the time when um, after Saul and Jonathan died, a member of the family, they went on the run, right? Because they're like, oh, Lord, David's going to come and kill us all because that's what kings do, right? When they take over the throne. Well, in the process of attempting to flee, the son was five years old at the time. The nurse picked him up and dropped him and he became crippled from trying to flee. Now, there's a whole other story about who was in your life that was supposed to help you but dropped you. That's a whole other situation. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a story for another day. But, but so that, that's the context of the son that was lame in both feet. And so verse 4 picks up. He said, where is he? He's living at the home of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. King David didn't lose a minute. He sent and got him from the home of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, came before David, he bowed deeply, abasing himself, honoring David. David spoke his name, Mephibosheth. Yes, sir. Don't be frightened, said David. I'd like to do something special for you in memory of your father, Jonathan. To begin with, I'm returning to you all the properties of your grandfather, Saul. Furthermore, from now on, you'll take all of your meals at my table. Shuffling and stammering, not looking him in the eye, Mephibosheth said, Who am I that you pay attention to a stray dog like me? I'm sure some of us have felt that way. When God smiles on us, when he meets us the way that he met us this morning, and we say, oh, God, who am I that you pay attention to a stray dog like me? Then David called in Ziba, Saul's right-hand man, and told him, everything that belonged to Saul and his family, I've handed over to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants will work his land and bring in the produce, provisions for your master's grandson, Mephibosheth himself, your master's grandson, from now on, will take all meals at my table. And so Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So they went from being on the run to being in the king's house. Come on, somebody. 
all that my master, the king, has ordered his servant, answered Ziba, your servant will surely do. And Mephibosheth ate at David's table, just like one of the royal family. Mephibosheth also had a small son named Micah. All who were part of Ziba's household were now the servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, taking all his meals at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. I just think that's so interesting that they make a point to remind us that he was lame in both feet. Because back then when somebody was lame in both feet, they were cast aside. They were overlooked. But he was lame in both feet. And David still called on him. And so after Saul and Jonathan's death, instead of doing what others before him had done, and instead of doing what people thought he should have done, I could imagine, I could imagine the people in his ears, David, what are you doing? You know they're going to try and come and take the throne. I could imagine the people saying, but everybody before you did it like this. So you need to do it like that too. I could imagine what people are saying, well, you should do this. You should not do this. But instead of doing that, David sought out an opportunity to show kindness to Saul's family. He didn't have to do that. He did not have to do that, but he sought out the opportunity. Nobody came to him and said, hey, they, they, you know there's a son and um, you should go get him. No, 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 no. David, of his own volition, sought out an opportunity to be kind. He wanted to show kindness to the house of Saul, not only because he trusted God, because we know David is a man after owns God's own heart and he trusted God, but also because he walked in forgiveness. Ephesians 4 and 32, it tells us, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So kindness and forgi forgiveness, they, they go hand in hand. So if you are struggling with kindness, if you feel like, I just, I, just, I just can't be kind to this person. You know, they've done so much to me, I, I can never be kind. They've never been kind to me. They've wronged me in so many ways. I would encourage you to seek forgiveness. Because if there is something blocking you from being kind to somebody, even somebody that has wronged you, even somebody that has intentionally sought to destroy you, once you learn to walk in forgiveness, again, because kindness is in God's nature and it is in God's character, you can walk in that character of God and become kind. And when you learn how to do that, you too, in your kindness, can help transform someone's life. Think about how David's kindness transformed Mephibosheth's lineage and his life. Because David sought him out. David was able to walk in forgiveness, sought him out, and just extended a kind hand. Extended his kindness to him. So much can change when you're willing to be kind. And so if you really want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, if you really want to be able to see change in the people around you, in the atmospheres around you, Ask God, help me be kind. Help me to seek out opportunities to show kindness in my relationships. Help me to, to walk in forgiveness and, and, and go to somebody who has wronged me and be kind. So I'm going to ask y'all to stand today. Because there are many, many of us, I'm sure, who want to make an impact in the world who want to leave your mark in the world, that when you leave this place, people will say they were here. 
But unfortunately, most of us identify more with Mephibosheth than we do with David, if I can be real. Most of us in this place, maybe you've been dropped. Maybe you were in relationship with somebody that was supposed to care for you and they dropped you. And now your spirit is crippled. Maybe you feel like you've been forgotten. Maybe you feel like Mephibosheth and you're like, who cares about a stray dog like me? Maybe you feel like you have nothing to give. Everything that you had has been extracted out of your life and you feel like you have nothing to give. Maybe you're like Mephibosheth and you have been running from the king who hasn't been in hot pursuit of you. You have been running away from the king in fear of his judgment. Because in your experience, you deserve judgment. That has been, has, that has been what has been told to you your whole life. You are in this situation and you deserve judgment. And so the Lord has been pursuing you and you've been running away because you don't want to experience that judgment. But just like David did from Mephibosheth, God is intentionally seeking you out today. He's extended his kindness and he's already welcomed you into his family. You're already welcomed into his family. And so how much more should we extend kindness to others that we encounter? Because again, the king has welcomed us. And when we are a part of the king's family, we can experience everything that he has for us. And that means you can walk in kindness. And so this morning, before I leave, I just want to pray for you. If you are somebody and you say, I feel like Mephibosheth, I don't have anything to offer. Just lift your hand right where you are. If you are somebody that says, I've been dropped and I feel crippled in my spirit and I don't know what else I can do to extend to somebody else, just lift your hand. Thank you. Father, I pray for every person that feels broken and forgotten this morning, Lord. I pray right now that even in this moment, that they recognize that this moment was ordained for them from you as a moment of kindness because you see them, you recognize them, you have sought them out. And you know that they needed this moment on this day. They, need, they needed to experience you in a kind way. And now that they ex have experienced you, they, they know they can walk in forgiveness. And they can extend kindness to others who have wronged them. Amen. Now I have a challenge for each and every one of you today. Just like David did. David sought out an opportunity to be kind. Even when people were telling him you shouldn't do that, even when people were telling him that is not the way we do things here, David says, no, 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 no. I'm going to be like my father in heaven. And I'm going to seek out an opportunity to be kind. So that's my challenge to us, Anchor, this week to keep your eyes open. Look for those people that need a kind word. Look for those people that need a helping hand. Look for those people that just are seeking God and show them that God is here through your kindness. Amen? Amen. Come on and give God some praise this morning. His presence is here. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We would love to continue connecting with you at anchorchapel.com where you can fill out a connect card. We would also love to partner with you in prayer and giving. 
we just want to remind you that there, there is hope, hope for, for every soul. soul.